Okay. So I am here to speak about the fierce feminine. I'm here to speak about the angry feminine. I'm here to call forth the I had enough already feminine. <coughs> Not long ago, I spoke with a friend of mine, and she is a social activist. She's deeply involved in politics. And as most of us, she's well trained, so she knows how to sit around a table, well behaved, and speak with logic and rational arguments of why it is wise <coughs> to, to end the war. But you know what, she said, you know what I really feel underneath all of that nice talk? I feel a tear down the house, pull out eyes, full-blown rage. We are, after all, talking about children. Children suffering, children in pain, children laying afraid at night. But of course, I cannot express that, she said. Nobody would take me serious. And I think she's right. It is almost as if we, uh, since women were invited into the more public arena of influence, it's almost as if we are allowed to play if we can behave, <laughs> if we can do it without, God forbid, becoming emotional. <laughs> and then she went on and she said, She, said, she asked a question that really, really resonates with me, a question that feels so important. I think we are all called to deeply investigate this question. She said, how can I express the rage I feel when I meet injustice without creating even more hurt, even more conflict? And frankly, she said, I have no idea of how to be with this force within me. Then I realized that this question has been with me for a long time. I was an angry child. I remember many, many times where I was just completely overwhelmed with anger. Uh, I, I remember one episode with a certain uh, vacuum cleaner <laughs> that would not move in the directions that I wanted it to move. <laughs> And I remember myself lashing out, trying to hurt the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> but of course, the only one getting hurt is these small, fierce fists. And my mother, she found me laying on my back, <laughs> screaming at the top of my lungs in this completely glorious, Oscar-worthy <laughs> tantrum. <laughs> and this is when she told me these words. She said, if you don't learn to control that anger, it's not going to go well with you in life. And it took some years, but I learned how to control my anger. When I uh, entered my teenage years, it's like just amazing how many incredible, efficient ways available to teenagers to suppress and numb their feelings. <laughs> And I adopted wholeheartedly <laughs> most of them. The inconvenience with this, the kind of downside, is that you can't really choose what feelings to suppress. You can't kind of only suppress the so-called negative feelings and then feel alive in the rest. So what I experienced that was that all my feelings were safely hidden, numbed down under this very thick lid. So now I felt cool in arguments. I felt cool facing vacuum cleaners, <laughs> dishwashers. <laughs> but I felt equally cool in the midst of intimacy, in the midst of love. So here I was, I felt the pain of the lashing out, out of control anger. And I also felt the pain of the suppressed feelings. And for me, for a long time, it seems like these were the only options. And this motivated me into an exploration that has, I have been involved with in for many, many years, together with many women in many countries, 
in the global awakening women community. And we are exploring how we can be with feelings, not as a problem to be fixed, not as something we should eventually overcome. We're exploring how feelings can actually be the expression of the gift we have to give in the world. We look at feelings uh, almost like the weather. It's like it comes in different flavors, in different forms, different level of intensity, and it constantly shifts and changes. So now the question is not how to get rid of feelings, but how to stay awake in the midst of the storm. And this exploration has led us to explore the different goddess myths from different traditions in the world. And an archetype of feminine rage we find in the Hindu mythology. It's a goddess called Kali. And the story of how Kali came into the world is from a time, a mythical time, long, long, long time ago, where the world was experiencing a great war. And it was a war between the gods and some very, very powerful demons. These demons were so powerful that every time anybody cut in them and a drop of blood hits the ground, new demons popped up. They were impossible to, to, to defeat. And the gods they were about to lose. And let me tell you a moment how serious this is. The gods we can see that they are symbolizing the aspect of ourselves that are compassionate, loving, awake, conscious. And the demons, they symbolize the aspect of ourselves that create conflict, hatred, misunderstandings, and perhaps the, the greatest misunderstanding of all, the illusion that we are separate from our surroundings. So you can imagine it's a serious, serious situation they're about to take over the whole world. And Durga, who's the goddess of feminine empowerment, and she is an expert in slaying demons. She realizes that here we need an even more fierce aspect of the feminine. And out of her forehead comes Kali. And Kali, she is pissed off. <laughs> she is so angry. Kali is so in love with truth that she is not willing to compromise an inch. Kali is married to truth. And with this kind of explosive expression of fierce love, she enters the battle. And the demons, they don't have a chance. She wins the war. But at this point, she cannot stop. It is as if she is drunk on blood. So she continues to destroy and destroy and destroy. Intoxicated, gone. And the gods, they gather together and they say, what are we gonna do with this crazy lady? <laughs> and they, they, they push um, Shiva, one of the gods. They say, Shiva, this is your wife, do something, stop her. <laughs> and Shiva, he's, he's trying his best to, to stop her. He's trying to stop her with force. He's trying to seduce her. He's trying to dance with her, nothing. <laughs> She's gone. Until what he does is that he lays himself with his vulnerable belly exposed. And he welcomes her. In the midst of her darkness, he meets her right there. And just as Kali is about to step on him, she wakes up and she's back. And the world is saved. <laughs> now Shiva, Shiva, he represents the aspect of our consciousness that can stay awake in the midst of the storm. Shiva is presence itself. Shiva is the capacity to stay present. 
The beauty is that when you see an image of Kali, a statue or a picture, you will never see her without Shiva. They go together. And here's an important key for us as we are revisiting and reclaiming this forceful expression of feminine love. We need also to cultivate the Shiva aspect. Shiva is the promise of choice. Now, sometimes we hear about feelings on one hand and the rational mind on the other hand as a, like a polarity and a way of being with feelings a way of controlling feelings, perhaps, is to move to the rational mind, to have a rational understanding of why you feel like you do. Now, Shiva is not the rational mind. Shiva is not thoughts. Shiva is presence. You can be just as present with thoughts as you can with, be with feelings. Shiva is the space in which thought arises and dissolves back into. Right now, you're experiencing this moment. You are hearing the sounds. You are feeling your body. You are noticing thoughts, feelings. If you, for a moment, shift your attention from what you're experiencing right now back to awareness itself, you begin to have a taste of Shiva. <coughs> now, let me give an, you an illustration of Kali expressed in real life without Shiva. And I want to go back to my own little soap opera of my life. <laughs> we can remember that I was there, <coughs> an adept in controlling my feelings. But by grace, very er early in my 20s, I got into therapy and I got in touch with my anger again. And sometimes when we get in touch with our anger again, it is as if it's thousands of years of suppression that now just have to be expressed, no matter what, it's my turn now. <laughs> and this situation was from the subway. I was in the subway with, with my dog, and on the subway, there were two uh, teenage boys with a water pistol, and they had much fun with shooting water at the people. Then they discovered my dog, and they began to shooting at my dog. And my dog was very old, and she didn't hear very well. She couldn't see very well. So I saw that she got very confused and even scared for what was going on. She didn't understand where the water was coming from. And she, she was like this. So I politely asked her to stop. <laughs> but this, they thought was even more fun. So they were shooting. And before I knew what happened, <laughs> I found myself, like howling at the top of my life, yeah! stop now! And I could feel this kind of irresistible movement in my hands towards the throat. But luckily, the, 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 the subway reached the station and they managed to escape. So here's, you can see an example of, of Kali, all right but not so much Shiva. <laughs> and we, I guess we can agree that I think it's quite appropriate that I would defend my dog, but you know, perhaps not so appropriate to, to, to murder somebody. <laughs> <laughs> there you can see, see. So as we are visiting this very, very, very powerful force of the feminine, we need to call it the Shiva. Kali, Without Shiva is destruction. Sh Kali with Shiva is medicine. And I believe it's the medicine that we need in the world today. Marianne Williamson, she speaks about the hyenas. She speaks about how the hyenas, they're very protective of their cubs. And not only their own personal cubs, but all the puppies of the pack they will protect. If somebody come too close to the puppies, <laughs> they're there. And with their whole body language, with their <sighs> sounds, it's 
very, very clear that it's not a good idea to come <laughs> any closer to these cups. And then I wonder, where are we? Where are we, the human mothers? Right now, in this moment, we have children in panic because it's bombing outside. Right now, in the moment, we have children being raped, children being hungry. Where are we, the human mothers? Why are we the saying, stop, not the children, not the children? And to answer that, I think, again, we have to go back to the fact that we've been so well trained to live in our rational mind. So when this very natural, healthy response arises in us, we immediately move to the rational mind and we begin to think, how? How am I going to do it? Who am I to stop a war? And then very soon, we collapse in hopelessness. And then we skip this step, just this step. <laughs> Of course we don't know how. But I believe that just in that step, in that fierce expression of family love, there is a power, a power that will open doors, a power that will show us possibilities that we don't know before we take the step. And I believe that we are called to visit Kali, visit the fierce expression of family love. And just say, <laughs> no, stay away from the children. Mm.